Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to have Troy Hall on tonight, uh, be treatment be treatment free beekeeper from Plainfield, New Hampshire. Tonight we will be discussing uh, spring buildup, breeding for mite resistance, uh, the configurations he uses, queen rearing, uh, inconsistent fall flows, and hopefully other things. We'll see how it goes. So can you give us a couple minute synopsis of how you got started in bees and where you are now? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Rainier, for inviting me on to your show. Um, it's always a pleasure. I, uh, I, I've known about, I, I've kind of seen what I've, I, I, I don't know if I, I, I've listened in or perhaps it was this podcast or whatever that you're doing that I saw a couple of things that you're doing and I've always was intrigued. Um, because I can empath I can relate. <laughs> I was where you were not too long ago. Um, so I started out uh, my late teens, early twenties, starting just as bee, you know, with bees as a hobby. And uh, my story, for those that are familiar with it, I, I stumbled across guys like Michael Palmer and Kirk Webster. Um, it seems like it wasn't that long ago, but this was probably in the early two thousands. Um, back again I keep telling everybody it's back when uh you know Mike and Kirk well Mike in particular he was kind of going on this campaign around all the local bee clubs uh educating everybody that you could overwinter nucleus colonies and this was an unheard of thing then which wasn't too long ago but it was it was a it was a big thing so anyways I kind of got to know uh who Michael was and kind of uh fell into the whole you know what is today is just kind of a, a normal it's kind of acclimated into the industry of with with you know overwintering nucleus colonies and raising queens, so um, I got I got acquainted with him, Michael Palmer, and helped him uh, catch some queen bees up to his his mating yards a few times, uh, and I, I I was just hooked in, into into bees. Everything about beekeeping, um, being outside was obviously you know something I always enjoyed nature, but then tying it into working with bees which for me was already a passion in my life. You know, in my early twenties, I was just already kind of on fire for, for beekeeping. Never really had an idea that it was going to turn into a vocation at that time in my life. Never knew that it was possible again, until I met guys like Mike. And then I, after a few years of befriending Mike, I, uh, I heard of this guy called Kirk Webster and um, my, our, my path, my path had not yet crossed, you know, with him at the time. I've never met him, met him personally, but I, I, I remember reading articles that he had written in the ABJ and bee culture and, he was kind of like this uh, guru, you know, in a sense. But uh, I remember meeting him in person one one time. I called him up and uh, made an attempt to go out and visit him. And uh, he was just kind of like the same kind of thing that Michael Palmer was, you know, a real beekeeper. He uh, he wrote a lot of stuff, but at the same time, his writings were based on his actual work with bees. And the thing that I noticed that I really liked about these two men in their lives was just the simplicity of their lifestyle and how they're they just did their work with bees and it was like where do you go and learn you no one was no one was telling me that i could do this <laughs> you know when i was younger um so i just felt like i stumbled across it and i and i was instantly hooked and i from my i i think i was 20 i don't know in my early 20s i just decided that i wanted to be a beekeeper and i wanted to be a non-migratory commercial beekeeper in the same sense that Michael and Kirk were and uh, kind of try to see if I can establish this simple lifestyle and this way of living and working amongst bees. Um, and, I, you know, just a quick introduction. I, I kind of grafted both of the I, the concepts that Mike and Kirk work with are, are very similar, um, different kind of techniques on how they use, you know, how is the bees for management, but very, very similar, very identical paradigms in a sense. Um, and I, I started raising queens in my operation at the time. I probably had around 50 hives and I was starting to raise queen bees early on, getting the idea yep. of how to graft, setting up cell builders, all their fun stuff. But once I started to raise my own queens, then, then I was able to tap into, um, I was able to tap into something that I think a lot of people are beginning to see and they can see like when it comes to sustainability, um, you, you harness this ability to, uh, kind of take control over the genetics, not hundred percent, but you, you can kind of start to play with things that you can't play with when you're buying Queens from outside your operation. Plus for me at the time, and for most people, it's just a sheer expense of queen bees. Um, there was a lot of money, you know, that I'd have to invest in every year into Queens that were coming from someone else's 
uh, work. But when I started raising my own queens, I could rapidly propagate them and rapidly propagate more queens than I could kind of use in house. You know, I could, I, if I wanted to make up a hundred nukes, I could raise a hundred cells very easily and make up a hundred nukes and, you know, kind of increase the number of colonies and, and spread mitigate risk uh, around. So essentially I, from my point I'm trying to get at is from the early onset of my beekeeping kind of ventures, I, I, I quickly kind of shied away from using treatments in a sense of like on a, on a, uh, Oh, just what's the word I'm looking for? Um, prophylactic kind of sense, because uh, at the time, you know, we've got to remember this was it wasn't too long ago. But our ways of measuring varroa mites back, you know, when mites in the early 2000s was we had alcohol washes and mite wash or sugar, you know, sugar rolls and stuff like that. But still, it was very kind of like figuring out what are we doing with mites then. It was still a lot of this new kind of stuff. Uh, the science wasn't really baked in yet, so. Um, I, I quickly started to get away from not treating the bees. Um, and when I started to raise queens, I could quickly get off the treatments completely. And that was, the, that was, a, that was, I think if I was to do that over again today, running, you know, 700 plus colonies, you know, 300 that I used to produce honey with, and I, you know, raise another three, 400 nucleus colonies and all the mating nukes. If I had, if I just inherited somebody's operation today, and, and, and someone said, Troy, are you going to, are you going to completely go treatment free? It's like, I don't think it would be possible. Um, I think this is something you have to kind of grow into something you have to phase into. And I don't even know if it's the right thing for everybody to do. I, that's the biggest thing I always tell people is like, I, my sole purpose for going kind of like down the treatment free uh, route wasn't because of some sort of, this is like the better than mentality. Like this is the, you know, a, a like everyone else is doing it wrong and the treatment free paradigm is the only right paradigm. I didn't believe that at all. Actually, I saw a lot of error with treatment free beekeeping because a lot of it was just kind of neglect in some ways. So I, I, I always tell people I chose to go the treatment free route because of a true breeding program that I had instilled in my apiary. And the only way at the time for me to evaluate resistance or even to feel like I was letting resistance kind of work its way into the breeding program was to withhold treatment. And then to find, you know, which queens and which colonies after years, seasons, if you will, without treatment, were actually doing something. So in a not if that if that answers the question a little bit about introduction, a little bit tapping into, you know, how you use queen rearing to create sustainability. But queen rearing is it's you know, if you want to raise if you want to be sustainable, you need to have bees. Right. You, you need to be able to, how, how are you going to how you replace your losses is really the key uh, component of sustainability. And queens are the queens are the the main ingredient for a beehive you without a queen bee you just have you know a bunch of bees that are going to all die off in a few weeks with queens and a small population of bees you can you can really rapidly propagate genetics and colonies number of colonies in a in a season and uh and really be quite sustainable with with raising your own stock and replacing your own bees in in queens every year yeah and i i um when I watch all, all like I've seen some of your videos and you, I think you've talked about it with Corey, but it's just always those nukes in those first year Queens from the year before that really make the difference in that next winter. When you overwinter, yeah. those are always the colonies that are bursting. So I try to reclean all mine every year, which obviously uh, it would be way too much money to buy that many Queens. Yes. So I have reared my own, but uh, like I didn't quite requeen all of them this year, but it's always, you just get so much more production out of those you know, fresh new queens from the year, but season before. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's, it's like, it seems to me like it's a no brainer, but that's who someone who's a bee nerd who wants to spend all their time learning about queen rearing and putting all the time and effort in. So it makes sense if you only have a couple of colonies, not to necessarily do it if you have two colonies and you don't want to spend every waking moment thinking about queen rearing, but it, uh, it, there's certain, there's a certain amount of, well, I just enjoy doing it, but also a certain amount of just practicality about it that's uh, makes everything a lot easier for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you have been, you want your goal is to, you know, breed mite resistance into your bees. And so from my understanding, you're going to be using UBO tests and did you start with Harbo assays last year or are you going to work that in? This yeah, year? I've, I've been using the Harbo assay for the last two seasons. Um, yeah. So, and it's that, that's, 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 that's been an eye-opening. Uh, it's been an eye-opening uh, tool to use in my apiary. Um, one of the biggest things that I stumbled across just a, just last year, and Corey Stevens talks about this, but 
it's you know we're we're we go into a hive for us up here in New England. You, you for me, you know, going into a hive in August uh, is you know that's the time of year when you're going to find mite loads. If you have not treated, you know, they're going to be at their you know the, you're reaching that zenith that that peak of mite population. So here I am. I'm going to some colonies that are that were breeder queens, or colonies that had have that that have always kind of expressed you know some sort of something special going on. So I go into, I remember going into this one particular colony and, and doing an alcohol wash or a wash. I wasn't using alcohol, but you know, Dawn dish, so whatever, a wash. And then um, if I, I, I have to look at my notes, but I remember the wash was like well above threshold, like 15 or, or 12 or something into the teens, you know, per 300 bees of mites. And then performing a Harbo assay on that same colony and finding no reproductive mites, but all non-reproductive mites. Um, and that was the biggest kind of uh, eye-opening experience using the Harbo essay is that, you know, just alcohol or what washes alone um, are kind of overlooking these queens that are, they're doing something. And I'm not, and there's a lot of, you know, there's, you just can't take what I'm, that one instance and, 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 and run with it because there's a lot of nuances with all of this, but it was just an eye-opening experience being able to go in you know, and, and pull out pupa and find a lot, you know, reproductive, non-reproductive mites in this population that was supposed in this colony that was above threshold. And, and that colony is still alive today. That, that I think I did that. Um, I, I did that last, yeah, just last August. I was in that particular colony. And I remember writing it down. It was just like this opening experience where how um, VSH in particular doesn't always correspond you know, with these low mite levels consistently throughout the year. But the, I, I, if you're familiar with who John Kefis is, he's, he was, um, he's over in France now, but he was kind of like the grandfather of, of treatment-free beekeeping um, in some ways. Um, but he, he had this term called, you know, it's their mite black holes. The mites go in, but they don't come out. And uh, this, you know, BSH obviously could be one component that was, that, that bees are using where they can kind of clean up mite loads, you know, where the mites go in, but the bees rapidly are constantly suppressing that reproductive, uh, you know, suppressing mite reproduction. So you end up with a bunch of population, the mite population is essentially a bunch of, you know, non-fertile, you know, non-laying mites. So the mites will eventually just kind of die off, but, um, or they go away. But anyways, just, just to shine some light, the hard boy say is definitely something I'm in, I, I, I enjoy using and it's, it's really opened my eyes. Uh, in that capacity, uh, that that uh, how mites are acting, or what what how bees are interacting with mites, and um, the UBOSA is definitely something I'm going to use this year. And uh, but the the biggest thing before all of these, you know, these two tools I were available on the market, whether it was Harbo's, you know, kind of way of of kind of coming up with a way to assess and do an essay in the field for BSH, or now with uh, uh, Terra's, you know, UBO essay. I felt the best way prior to any of this stuff being available, how, how, how else do you, how, without using the Harbo assay and without using UBO, how does a beekeeper go about finding and raising mite resistant queens or bees? You know, it's like, that was my biggest question because you know, we've got to remember not too long ago, we didn't really have any of these tools. The VSH um, assays were very, very uh, time consuming uh, before John Harbo kind of simplified it and came up with the, you know, just selecting out a hundred or 200 pupa before you had to select, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of pupa just took way too long for somebody on my scope and scale to, to go digging in and finding VSH. So a lot of people like myself who were looking for VSH had to go to like someone like Tom and Suki Glenn at the time, or directly to Harbo or somebody at the USD or one of the B labs that would have, you know, VSH stock. So it was very a limited source of VSH then, but I, I really, and I still do today, that I think the best way to kind of contribute towards um, uh, resistance is obviously by just withholding treatment. Um, and I say that obviously with, I don't know if everyone's gonna understand what I mean when I say that, but you have to allow natural selection to kind of, you have to allow, you have to have pressure, right? You can't have too much, you can't kill the bees, but you have to have constant pressure from a specific host or parasites like that being varroa mites uh, pressed upon the colonies for the bees to be able to constantly uh, be engaged and figuring out how to deal with it. Because once the pressure's off, I don't think the bee, you know, the bees have no incentive how to, to learn to uh, to figure out how to, to deal with mites. So anyways, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. But uh, to answer your question to how do I, how am I doing it? 
I'm, I guess I'm doing it threefold. I still, all my breeder queens are coming from colonies that are treated. Um, all the uh, all the breeder queens are run through the Harbo assay, and now this year they're going to all have a UBO, you know, assay as well. So it's I, I just think it's fascinating that we have these tools available because we couldn't quantify this stuff not too long ago. So it's really it's really cool. It's really it's really uh, interesting times that we live in. Absolutely, I I've, I've had very similar thoughts. It's it's I think since 2020 that was the first time. That's I think Corey when Corey said that John Harbo kind of like let the cat out of the bag and started to show people i'm not sure if it was a specific group but like it's only been a few years yeah and so it's it's just incredibly exciting to think what the future could hold in that sense that we've only been doing this for just a few years and very few people uh so it's just it's it's incredibly exciting that we could be moving like even if i just had to do one winter treatment and my bees kept the mites down relatively well for the rest of the year how many beekeepers would jump on and love that like just one treatment a year or you know it it's it's just very exciting. Oh yeah, it's and that's that's the whole goal um, is to kind of why wouldn't you want to run an apiary where you, you're not you know where the bees could do a lot of the heavy lifting in regards to varroa mites than the beekeeper and instead of using two or three or six or whatever if you're a commercial guy if you were using six treatments or more a year you can find yourself using three or two or you know, less treatment needed and the bees are still thriving and they're healthy and sustaining, you know, your operation is sustaining itself, if not, you know, kind of completely out of control with the number of bees that, that are being maintained. I think that's the, that's the big objective. For sure. It's, it's always interesting to me. Like I'm trying to understand, I, I know it's a new thing, but like I, if it's going to catch on, how is it going to catch on? Like I'm like, I know that a lot of larger queen producers sell to, you know, small or beekeepers, but still larger. And so to me, it would seem profitable for them to buy, you know, mite resistant queens, because as we just talked, talked about less time treating and it takes them, you know, they have to pay for people to treat them or do it themselves. So uh, mm -hmm. hopefully the profitability, you know, helps drive that change. But uh, we'll we'll see, I guess, in the next couple of years, how far yes. that goes. Yep. We got uh, short pants bee farm almost forgot. Well, good thing you didn't. Very excited for tonight. Uh, <laughs> Waiting for the season to start, so am I. I'm sure Troy is rearing to go as well. Yeah. And we got Ian on here. Oh, good to see you, Ian. Yes, good to see him. Um, I got our local conference coming out March 16th, and Ian will zoom in. Well, that must be a treat. He's always a uh, he always has colorful things to say, as we did with our <laughs> live chat last year. Yep. <laughs> and. Um, I loved what Randy Colliver, uh, Oliver has done with just mite washes, but I don't have 1500 colonies. Yeah. So I was meaning to ask you about that, uh, Troy. So how many colonies were you able to Harbo test last year? Do you know? Roughly? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm only Harbo testing anything that is a potential breeder. So that, yep. that limits, uh, how do I come out? So how do I describe how that comes up to be? Essentially in my management uh, in my, and all my breeder queens come out of my honey production colonies. So those, those are colonies that have the oldest queens. Those are the colonies that have to kind of go and run the gauntlet um, with without, so essentially, so this is how it is. In the last couple of seasons, my honey production colonies is the part of my apiary that I will use a treatment. You know, I, I will use formic acid, uh, like a formic pro, formic pro on, a, on a population or percentage of these colonies to keep them obviously from just going away. Um, and, but we, we do, I am selecting out of that population that's not treated the breeding stock. Um, and that's out of, out of the other parts of my apiary with the nucleus colonies and all the mating nucleus colonies, those colonies are not, we don't use treatments on those. So that's kind of my approach. Again, I don't want to get off onto a rabbit trail, but two years ago, I lost 90% of the apiary. So I'm, I'm not in a hurry to kind of repeat that. So I, I'm kind of taking an approach where if we're, we're pulling off honey and we're seeing colonies stressed with PMS or whatever, we'll, uh, we'll get to work with putting a treatment on them. Um, but we all, obviously I'm documenting which ones that look great. They don't need the treatment and we're selecting that for breeding stock. So I'm, I'm finding these breeder, breeder queens and those two-year-old colonies. And um, I keep pretty not, for me, it's like the, you know, you know how beekeepers are with notes. <laughs> it's like you find the system that works and you just have to take a quick glance across the yard and you know everything what's going on with queens and statuses of colonies. And then obviously if you need to know more, you start digging into the hives, but I kind of have something very similar on, on the inner covers or grain bags. I just kind of document the families which are corresponding to the queens. 
Um, and anything that's that has proven itself over several seasons, I know where those queens are. And then so in the spring, like right probably in the next 60 days, you know, in, by the end of April, early May, we get out there, go to those particular colonies. We know that those breeders are in and we start doing harbo assays. Typically, well, actually we do, we do, I've been doing harbo assays on those breeders last fall, right? Cause we, cause obviously we want to get those assays done when the mites are at their highest, the colonies are stressed. Um, and the first year I did harbo assay, we did them in the spring and Corey Stevens will tell you doing a harbo assay, doing a harbo assay in the spring on colonies uh, coming out of the winter, all your, there's no mites, at least in my colonies. It's, it's, it's there's just no mites anywhere, really. The mite loads are really low. So harbo assays can kind of be a false, uh, false negative in the, in the first part of the year. So we do, we keep track of the harbo assay in the fall. And then in the spring, we come back in and now we'll, you know, obviously you will, we have UBO, we'll give that a go to see if there's any course corresponding um, things going on there with UBO. And then we will select that, those particular queens for breeding. So how many, how many harbo assays are we doing? It depends upon how many breeder queens I want to select. I usually like to have anywhere from eight to 12 breeder queens that we're, you know, we're grafting from for the season just to get a good diverse um, pool of daughters. Cause I, what the way I'm doing is we're taking the breeders, we're grafting those Queens go into nucleus colonies over winter and then they go into honey production. So I kind of graft, I like to graft from half the population of, of families that I have in my apiary and kind of fold them in every year so that they're always kind of, there's never this consistent kind of family that I'm always breeding from every year. Um, there's one particular family that I do graft from for the last couple of years, just because they're so great. There's, it's hard for me to pass it by. And, and I was always worried about inbreeding. And I think that actually <laughs> the inbreeding thing with queen breeding, um, at least if you're open mated and you got a, you know, pretty good big population of drones in the area. I, I always tell like in my case, I'm not too worried about inbreeding. Um, I would be if I was using the same queen with same daughters exclusively every year, but being that there's such a big pool, um, I'm not at this point, like I, I'm not, I'm not afraid to kind of step in and say, all right, let's, let's take this daughter from this last year's breeder or whatever it can go down the line. It could be the same daughter, same family of Queens we're raising from for the last three or four deck, uh, four seasons and, and just constantly keep pushing that along and see what, what comes of it. But, um, uh, I don't know, I get off on these tra rabbit trails, but to answer your question, how, how often are we doing these, these, uh, Harbo essays or how many I'd, it, it really depends on the number of breeders. I, I'd say, um, if we have 12 breed, if we, if, if we find 12 breeder Queens, we probably did, we probably did Harbo assays on like 30 colonies to get the 12, you know, to kind of really, cause some of the, obviously do a Harbo assay in the fall and the queen looks great, but she doesn't pass muster for VSH. Then we kind of, we push that out of the, out of the breeding program. Um, but this is a lot of work though, too, cause there's always something else going on. You know, we got, we got honey that we're trying to get off the bees and harvest and process and, so there's only so much time in every season that you have to devote to to breeding or to really focus in on these sp specific things that really promote good genetics. But I, I just try to make it a priority. And and uh, sometimes I, I feel like I, I compromise other parts of my apiary with production for the sake of breeding, which is hard, right? Because I'm doing all together. I'm trying to produce a crop of honey. I'm trying to breed queens and trying to raise and make bees. And so sometimes you have to do that dance, at least I do, you know, with what's, what's really important. And uh, if I want to feed my family, I need honey, uh, you know, and I'd like to have a good apiary and good, you know, uh, with good stock. So I need to, at the same time, do, a, you know, due diligence with, uh, with selection and with, with the work that needs to be done for selecting queens. Absolutely. So like out of those, you said you tested 30 ish. And so the 12 that you chose as breeders, for I'm assuming next year from the way you talked about it. Uh, what did they all test fours, threes? What, what were your roughly? Yeah, four. I, 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 I'm not, a, I'm not proud. You know, I'll take threes. <laughs> they don't all have to be fours. Heck, I mean, sometimes, cause I'm not exclusively using Harbo as like the sole means for breeding. Uh, I like, I mean, I'm like, I, I want most of my breeder Queens to have the VSH, ex you know, high VSH ex expression. But if there's, there's been a few queens that they're that are coming from families that just are there's something about them. I don't know every beat. Some people might understand what I'm saying, but there's just something about them. It's like I got nothing to lose by by folding them in and and to the stock, you know, by grafting a, you know some daughters and and seeing how those daughters play out. Um, so yeah, there are there are some queens that come through that are you know that'll pass really low on a harbo assay, or we didn't even assay them. 
I didn't have time to, but here we are in the spring. This colony's got, I got all the notes for production for, you know, their, this queen is three or four, three years old, no treatment. It's like, all right, what is she doing? Um, something. But uh, so we do still, we do occasionally fold in some queens that are not BSA, you know, assessed for BSH just, yep. just because why not? Yeah. Well, I mean, if they survive, then there's obviously something going, but you've talked about like you thought, or I'm not sure if you said this exactly, correct me if I'm wrong, but like early on you thought, well, if I just keep letting the bees, you know, breed without them dying over time, they'll become completely resistant. And yes. as far as I'm, yeah, the last time that you, I think I heard you talk about this with Corey a year or two ago, you're like, well, they, they get sl slightly more resistant because of the drones and how many different drones they mate with. It's really hard to concentrate to get like a high percentage. Right. Yes, exactly. No, the mystery for me was for, for a decade without, for you know, it's literally for 10 years, you know, just strict, strictly selecting from those that survived. Because I, I remember we, we, I wasn't using Harbo, didn't have UBO, had no means to quantify resistance other than just selecting from colonies that survived without treatment and not just survived one season, but two seasons without treatment. So I, I it was, it was perplexing, you know, to come to some, especially in the last 2020 when I lost 90% of the apiary and even up until that point, 2018, 2019, I started to see a higher mortality kind of creep into my bees. And it's like, well, what's going on? You know, and you could clearly see, I could clearly see that there was a lot of mite pressure there again. So um, clearly just breeding from surviving stock is not sufficient in my opinion from, from what I was doing. There's, there's something that's overlooked. So I think that's what's so phenomenal is to now have tools like the, an ability to select for VSH traits and whatever UBO is going to offer us. But if these things can actually start to quantify the mechanisms that the bees are using for, for getting on top of mites, and, and in a few years on my end, if I can start to say, hey, I, I have, I have, I'm going from 35% winter mortality to 15% or 20%. I mean, that's a, that's, that would be phenomenal. Um, that would be a huge push in the right direction for me. So um anyways I, I got i got distracted no i think that's exactly exactly what i meant so are, are how are you leveraging your drones are you doing drone flooding yards have you been able to fold that into the yep um early so just to, just to, again because if there's people here i always get questions when it comes to you know people that are just starting to raise and breed queens it's like they always tell me well i can't do it and then it's like well why can't you and they it's like do you really want to and if you really want to don't, don't worry about your drones, you know, that you're going to have your queens mate with. Just get, just start raising queens. And as a beekeeper, that if you're serious about queen breeding and you're serious about running a business in bees, by raising your own queens in time, you will take care of the drones because you're going to have more colonies to be able to supply the drones in the future. But to get started, you need to have bees. So start with just raising queens. That's what I did. I started with raising queen bees. And then a few years into it, you know, once I started to have hundreds of colonies, I could now saturate my mating yards with those with those targeted colonies for drones. And to, today that's what I'm doing. You know, it's been kind of something that's been established where I run two mating yards. They're about, um, as a crow flies, they're probably a mile and a half from each other, maybe two miles. Um, but we're, you know, right on, we're right on the Connecticut river Valley here and, and surrounding, you know, kind of in, in, encompassing these two mating yards. I have uh, roughly a little over a hundred colonies that I target for drones. Um, and the biggest thing that I like to do in the beginning, and I still do it today, is I like to target drones that are dark phenotypes, um, because that was a way in the early days uh, that reassured me if I could get, if I could have dark drones mating with somewhat dark queens, that it would show me that I have targeted matings that, that were somewhat successful, because there was, you know, pet guys, people, all these yellow, I call them yellow bees, <laughs> and all, all, some of us Yankees up here in New England, you know, it's like a, we see those package bees and it's just like, uh-oh, we got that stuff slipping in. We don't need any of that. But um, nothing wrong with package bees in a sense. But just for the sake of just, you know, humor humor me or whatever. But, um, yeah, so I, I decided to kind of breed for darker bees, not ho like solely, but just darker just to show me, you know, how successful were these queens actually targeting uh, the drones that I wanted to mate with. And here we are. It's crazy to think that it's almost like, I don't know, 15, 16 years or something. And most of my bees are pretty dark. I mean, they're not all like dark, dark, but most of them are pretty dark. Um, it's a pretty consistent thing that I'm seeing. So that's reassuring to some degree, I guess, that I know that my targeted, my mating yards are doing a good job at targeting drones. Yeah. 
So in, in your opinion here, Troy, do you think that the UBO assessment will be, replace the Harbo assay or are you going to use them in tandem? What's your, you know, yeah, no, I, I, I'm really excited. I, if the UBO assay, if this season and, and obviously going into the next couple of seasons, if it's, if I can feel like it's doing what I like, if I, a lot of this stuff as farmers, I think you just kind of like you, 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 you trust your experience, you trust your intuition, but if the UBO assay instantly starts to say, show some results, like, wow, this is, this is something special here. And like obviously guys like Corey that have taken the time to kind of do the the Harbo and and uh, and in UBA UBO and show that there's a lot of overlap there. So he Corey can do a lot of the heavy lifting that I don't have time to do so much. Um, yeah, no. If, if UBO shows me and I can feel like that it's worth solely using UBO, then I it's a huge time saver instead of going through all the breeder queens and and pulling out you know a hundred or even you know oftentimes two hundred pupa. I mean, I, who's, I, it, I have to make time for that, but if I could, if I could rely on a, a spray, <laughs> you know, come back, you know, kind of do the systematic thing where you apply UBO in a several, several locations and come back and assess the, you know, how the bees are pulling out the pupa, that would, that would, I'd love for that to be the sole means for measuring resistance if, if that uh, is, if that's how it pans out. Absolutely. Um, yeah. My computer is currently sitting on a UBO test kit, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm hoping to start. I mean, I only have 18 hives, so I'm probably not going to find much resistance, but it's more just like to get it, get the system down of doing the actual testing. So then in future years, when I have more colonies and a higher chance of actually finding some measurable uh, resistance that I'll be able to find it. Yes. Um, Ian's clamoring for more of your videos. Uh, <laughs> the wax. Yeah, gotta, uh, it's so hard for me to drag a camera along out, you know, what I'm doing. Uh, and sometimes it, I get, I get into this mindset where I feel like what I'm doing really isn't all that important. Like everybody knows what I'm doing already, but, uh, I, the, 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 more that I do do videos, the more that I do find that, you know, there's, there's something, I was not that I'm unique, like in many ways, every, you know, beekeepers are beekeepers, but there's a lot of things that I'm doing, I guess, that I, that are clearly, uh, people are interested in. So it's kind of like spurs this kind of thing within me to, to kind of feed the, uh, feed the, the interest that's out there. So yes, Ian, I will, I'll have to get on that and, and start to be disciplined at uh, dragging my camera with me, which I'll, I'll be doing here shortly. So. Have you, have you messed with a tripod? It's probably 20, 15, 20 bucks. It's more editing. So I, that would be the big downside, but if you get a tripod with you, then you don't have to recruit. So, yeah, no, I, I got, I've just been using like clip champ or something, some cheap free ed video editing software. Cause I figure most of the videos, most of people's attention span on YouTube is 10 minutes. So it's not like you got to do these really intensive videos. So, um, anyways, yes, but yeah, no, the video, the whole video the YouTube thing was something I was really apprehensive to do. Um, cause I, I, I don't want to kind of, um, uh, feed into this weird, um, hierarchy of beekeepers or something. I, I, I truly just want to be somebody who speaks and does things from what I actually do with bees first and not put on this personification of like this expert that does a lot of talking and not really a lot of beekeeping. Um, so anyways, I, I've, I'm glad that, uh, <laughs> I'm glad that people are, are, are enjoying it. Yeah. I mean, I'd seen some stuff in your videos that I hadn't seen anywhere else. So, um, he was, this was in reference to the, uh, Harbo assays and like kind of balancing everything in between. And uh, I do like that term, uh, folding in the families. It sounds like, a, I don't know, very wholesome, you know? Yes. Well, it is. I mean, that's the only way I can think of it. It's like, it's, you're kind of like kneading bread, you know, you're kind of taking this dough, your bee population, and you're constantly folding. Cause that's really all you, I mean, breeding is never done. The work of the work of breeding is an on, it'll be, a, it's a lifetime's work. And it'll never, it'll, it'll just be handed off to the next generation whenever someone like myself or whoever else is, in, is, is, a, is called to, to the heavy work of, of breeding. It'll just be left to the next generation to improve upon it. But while we're doing it, we just, you just kind of find a system that, that seems to be working or that is, that is yielding the results that are, that you're looking for. And you've tried to improve upon that system. But every year when it comes to like actually selection, you're just picking from a population and, for me, obviously it's gotta be, you don't kind of just, for me, it's been kind of this closed population. You bring in some stuff every once in a while, but you kind of have this somewhat closed population and you're just selecting from 
whatever you know you're selecting and you're re re uh, repopulating you're pushing out more of that particular queen's genetics into your apiary every season and it's amazing how it kind of goes out there and it kind of gets tested and it gets it gets pushed it gets trampled down and, and then it flourishes and then you know you come back and revisit that a few years and it's it's not the same queen those those if you think about it those genetics aren't the same and so like so in some ways they are but selection is is changing the bees you know what i mean it's like they there's things that are static and then there's things that are not static that are more the kind of like malleable that the bees adapted to so it's like you're constantly kind of picking up and pushing things forward that are that are that are improving themselves one would like to think but that's kind of how i look at it so yeah as, as beekeepers we always hope we're moving in the right direction <laughs> yeah um, yeah, it's, and I guess that's what makes it so fascinating is I could see myself breeding bees for the rest of my life and you would never be done. That's, that's, uh, well, it's a gift and a curse at the same time. Depends on how you look at it. Yeah. We got, um, Ian here, baloney, your content is interesting. I want to see real life beekeepers. We need to see it, <laughs> Troy. We need to okay. see it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so you've been, you've been doing some trading over the past couple of years. Um, how, how have your winter losses been, or, well, this is 10 years, but in the, especially in the last couple, how is it, have you, have yes. you seen a major difference? Um, yeah, the last, well, I just tried to like the last, well, two, in 2020, I lost, that's when I lost most of the apiary. So that yeah. was a huge, that's the first time I ever experienced that up until that point, obviously I was pretty much treatment for hundred percent treatment free. And I was running mortality, average mortality, probably around 35 35 to 40 percent, uh, somewhere in that range. If you took like that 10 year average, somewhere in there, like there maybe 36, 38 percent. But the there was always like 35 to 40 percent. And this, I, I don't want to get off too far on a tangent, but I always tell people, um, and it's hard for some beekeepers to understand this because of just it's so foreign and it's hard to kind of explain it. I set myself up to withstand those types of mortality rates from the beginning. Uh, by, by again, the whole sustainable aspect with queen rearing, knowing that I was going to have higher mortality due to withholding treatments, I decided to say, okay, I need to have, it's a numbers game. If you want, you know, if you want a hundred colonies into the coming through into spring as a queen, as someone who's breeding and, and propagating bees, and you have the ability to kind of harness that energy, I can say, all right, if I want a hundred bees coming into next season, I need to have 200 bees going into the winter, right? So it was very easy for me to play the numbers game and just work hard at propagating certain numbers of bees with the right genetics to get that hundred queen, that hundred colony mark into the spring. So most of the times it worked. It worked very well. I was able to say, all right, I need I need three hundred colonies. That means I need I need to make up at least you know three hundred nukes, three hundred and fifty nukes. I need to double my numbers every year so I can get a haircut in the spring. And I was okay with that. I know most beekeepers are not. But I, I became very, and, be, and being the fact that these are the nucleus, the nucleus colonies were the ones, you know, that I replaced all the losses with. But um, anyway, so that the, 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 the ideal winter mortality for me in my workload and just the way things go for me was 35%. I always felt with 35% mortality, I had a lot of empty drawn comb to get ahead of all the colonies that were still alive, you know, the 75% that were still alive. I had enough kind of empty equipment just to keep ahead of things. Um, and it was like this perfect kind of um, match where if I had every box plugged up with bees in April, I would have been, I mean, th then I, obviously it's a whole different business. I'd have to, I'd have more probably pro profitability with bees. If I was smart, I'd sell more, I'd have to hire help. But being that it was just me, you know, I kind of, again, it's all how you look at things, how you manage things and all how you kind of come out, you know, in the end with, with what you're doing. But um, I always felt 35% was, was a good number that I, that I was able to uh, manage very well. W winter mortality. Yeah. And then the 25%. last, like this year, I don't think I had, I mean, this year, the winter mortality is, is hardly, it's hard to find dead colonies. I don't know what it is, right? And it's too early to tell for me, but I mean, just going, you know, visiting, going out and looking at making sure fences are up and looking at the colonies that are flying. Um, I mean, we had pollen coming in today. It's the first, uh, it's like two weeks early. Anyways, but uh, it looks like, well, you know, it'll be maybe 15% winter, you know, mortality or something, maybe 10%, dare I say. But I mean, every, most of everything I've seen in the nuke yards, it's hard to find any dead colonies in the nukes. So it'll look, it'll look like this year will be pretty good. 
Do you think that's a, that's the combination between treating a certain percentage and then maybe the harboassay is concentrating? I mean, is that your hope? Um, I don't know. I mean, again, the colonies like the, in the nucle in the nuke yards, I did I didn't treat them at all. They're completely untreated, yeah. and there's hardly any dead outs. Uh, in the honey production yards, we treated probably thirty percent of that population of bees, and I don't know yet. I haven't really looked, but you know, thirty if I if that thirty if thirty percent of three hundred. You know, if you figure, uh, you know, if they, if they, if, if they're still alive, that's great. You know, that's, 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 that's the payment that the treatment paid for itself. Um, but I, the, what I can tell so far, just kind of tr looking into some of the production yards where those colonies, those are the colonies that we treat again, I'd say three quarters to, you know, most of them are, look like there's, there's bees alive and doing quite well in them. Yeah. It's, so it's I hard kinda... to go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, when when you when you when I was listening to the conversation you had with Corey, I think you even had two, but I kind of had a realization like some years you could get really high percentages over winter. I'm sure you had some that were better than others, and, but then you had that really high loss in the winter. So like the way I think of it now is the treatments smooth out everything, so they prevent you from having very little bees, and so it just kind of it's kind of like the it's like a grader. It kind of just evens everything out over the years rather than the high yes. variability. Yeah, you got it. It's a good yep. way to describe it. Yeah, it just makes it so that you don't have to go on antidepressants every winter <laughs> <laughs> and drink a lot of beer and, and do things that get you in trouble. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's funny. Ian's like, the bees make me a manic depressive in the spring. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, no, I, I've, I've reached a point in my life, you know, I'm in my late 30s now and I'm with a family. You know, my, my, I, I need, this is not this is not just some kind of philosophical thing I'm trying to make an argument for anymore. This is, this is to my family depends upon my ability, our ability to drive income from our apiary. So this is a real living kind of thing. And it's not just some, some, some thing, right. That I, that I, anyways. Uh, so I, I have, it's the immense amount of pressure, you know, it's there every, I mean, cause again, uh, we're as a beekeeper, as a farmer, you're self-employed, you know, you're, 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 it's all relying upon you to get out and do the work and only, you know, how to do it and your hired help if you have that. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of responsibility and uh, you're either cut out for it or you're not. Yeah. It's, it's the pressure sometimes you really feel it. And that's me saying that with 20 hives and not needing, like if they all died, then I'd be fine. So I can only imagine the difference that would, that would be, but. Yeah. Well, I always tell myself, I mean, the reality is that even if, you know, if the whole thing failed, right. If, if it all came to, to just crumble around me, life would still go on and I would do what I need to do. Right. It's not the end of the day. You know, I'd probably yeah. tell my wife, it's all right, we're going to go get a, we're, I'm, I'm going back in, you know, I'm going to get some more bees and we'll do it different this time. Or I don't know, <laughs> but anyways, so. Yeah. It's um, that's one of those addictive parts of beekeeping is no matter what happens, there's, you always can say, well, I'm going to do it different next year. It's going to be better next year. Better luck next year. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah it's uh, it's so addicting. And uh I, I just try to, for me at least, uh, I just try to my, tell myself, I mean, worrying about it isn't going to do a dang thing. So I can worry about it for six months and that will do absolutely nothing to fix <laughs> whatever's yep. going on in the hives. They're either going to make it or they're not. So, yep. So we both have similar challenges from your interview with Duck River Honey with the fall flow. So at least for me, sometimes we get like 60, 80, 100 pounds from our goldenrod in early September to like pretty quick, short period, like two, two and a half weeks. And um, I know you get some, not weed, but you have similar problems. Some years you get a lot and some years you get none. So can you speak to your strategy and like how you've figured that out over the last 10 years? Yeah. How, like how I, how I manage an inconsistent honey flow. Yeah. In um, fall, yeah. Yeah. No, it's sometimes I wish I went to Vegas and uh, you know, played the slots because <laughs> it's kind of the same thing, you know, you're making that bet. Um, I take a look around. Um, I think there is some things to be found, you know, when it comes to a fall flow for us, typically the old, the old adage is with a good, good, decent amount of rain in July um, and in June, you know, you get, uh, you get a good gold, you know, the goldenrod kind of just sets itself up to produce nectar. If it's dry all spring long or all summer long. And if it's a dry, you know, dry whole, the whole month of July, we don't get much rain and and it's just been dry. Uh, typically, I see a correlation there with goldenrod, at least where I'm at, not really yielding much. Um, 
so I, I, when it comes to the forage, I do kind of pay attention to rain. I do pay attention to what the season's doing before everything starts to kind of come into bloom to kind of make a determination on, you know, is it going to be worth putting out supers or, or is it just uh, one of those years where you just better, you know, it's best to, you got to get some supers on the bees because they're just going to get plugged up with honey and they might even swarm in September or something. But uh, um, I, I also, so it's two parts. I look at the, I kind of, I gauge, you know, the environment and then I gauge the bees, obviously the mechanisms that are going to actually produce the honey. And um, I, I try, I only super colonies, the yards that are kind of close by uh, again, because I don't really have the capacity to go out and super every single colony for a honey flow in the fall um, because it's such a short window. I got to get that honey off. We got to get feed in if they need it. And I'd hate to, you know, I, I hate setting up colonies just to produce honey, to take the honey back and then to say that they need, you know, four or five gallons of syrup, you know, and that's all got to be happening right there on top of each other. Because you mentioned it's just this like two week kind of window and feels like it's barely compacted. So I take, uh, for, for I, I produce fall crops of honey on, on the apiaries that are kind of close by the honey house here, you know, take, take uh, you know, 100 plus colonies, maybe 200 colonies to super for honey in the fall and we get what we get. And that's really what it is. Like, it's like you mentioned, some, some years, like this last year, we did get a decent amount of fall honey, um, but it was the first time in probably maybe six years that we got a, a fall crop like this. I mean, when it comes to volume, um, the the knotweed honey you know is very kind of isolated we have we have a handful of yards that we we can get a you know true varietal honey from knotweed so i'm pretty consistent to super those yards every year just because knotweed is more consistent with production where i am i don't know if it's the case for other people but every year the knotweed produces a, a little bit of a crop to a you know a a, a, a crop worth harvesting uh, regardless of rain or regardless of environmental conditions it's the goldenrod's the biggest variable for for me in a sense. And uh, again, I'm in a river valley. Most of the apiaries that I have are in a river valley. I find if we get off the river valley, the fall the fall crops good, but the summer crops are horrible. So I I kind of like to kind of take it. This the summer crops of honey are more are more uh, resourceful or more productive for me. So I'm willing to say, you know what? I don't need all the fall honey. Let's get the let's get the gold. Let's get the basswood, the locust, the clover stuff that makes a nice, a nice honey in the drum and a nice honey in the bottle. And uh, we'll, we'll get the fall crop when we can, if that answers your question. Yeah, I think, I think that answers it pretty well. So you, you, like you said, you get it on, you get it off really quickly. You super the short or the close yards because that's your best shot at getting them on and off. And so if they do yeah. put what little honey they have in the supers, you still have a few weeks to get as much feed. Do you feed two to one after that? After you yes. pull the honey or yep. supers? Yep. Two to one sucrose syrup. How, how much do you tend to find you need per colony or per yard or however you? Yeah, it depends. Um, it some, some years, and it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty rare, but some years the bees are just bone dry of honey. They're just light feather light. And those years are really scary, right? Cause uh, every, any year you come up against nutritional stress when the bees are going into winter, uh, at least for me, those are the years where the bees are really in, like I get nervous because if they're nutritionally stressed then you're going to have dead bees in the spring. That's the correlation I've seen with mortality rates is, and I know Ian, he's listening in, but you know, he's been pushing, you know, nutrition and everything with his management scheme. And, and I, I've always, you know, understood that, but I never really fully understood it. I never applied it until a few years ago. And um, now I, now I'm a big, big proponent of, you know, make sure that the bees are nutritionally satisfied. Um, that being protein, if you need to, like I've been feeding pollen substitute, in the fall now or late in the summer and i never used to do that but i do see a direct correlation with with feeding pollen substitute to colonies that are taking it in late july early august building up that winter cluster um, and the survival of those colonies is, is greater in those populations that i'm feeding that pollen substitute to and obviously feeding them two to one when they need it but to answer your question on average i'd say most colonies will get two gallons of syrup maybe two and a half gallons of syrup to kind of get them to a target weight Yep. Yeah. I, my best guess is probably three gallons, which I can't, which is like, uh, 54 pounds of sugar somewhere, somewhere. Yeah. In that neighborhood, yep. 40 to 50 pounds of sugar per hive. Um, and I couldn't believe it. I was out there, um, today and someone like I had one colony and it's probably eight frames of bees. Um, and to give you context, we won't get pollen for probably, I mean, I think we're a week early, so maybe in a week, but probably our first pollen won't be for another two weeks. And, uh, 
and I had that, it was eight frames. So I was like, man, it's going to be light. And they were still really heavy. And I had that on other large colonies too. <laughs> and I, so I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. They were light. You felt that they were light in this, in the fall. Uh, no, I fed them really hard, but oh, okay, I assumed okay. cause they've, uh, they're the two hives that I'm thinking of specifically are, um, were virgins that I bought from Corey last year and yep. they are larger than probably they're in the top, you know, 10% of my 18 hives as far as size goes. Uh, they're mm. maybe the two largest or out of the four largest and they're really big, but they're really heavy. And so it's just kind of an interesting, I, that's, sh that shouldn't make sense, but it's happening. So. Yeah, yeah, no, it's that those are the components. That's what you want. You want really, you want bees that are, that obviously have everything, you know, big populations or modest populations with good, with, with food when it's needed, you know, and especially in the, in the fall and then in the spring, if they, if they go into these big populations and they come out with big populations and they're still as heavy as lead. Um, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, obviously it makes yeah. for a little bit of, of a trick, you know, once the season gets underway and they plug up the brood nest really quickly because they haven't eaten all the honey or the syrup you yeah. fed them. But that's, that's the beekeeper's job then is to get those colonies set up to produce honey and coming out of the, get, get them coming out of the winter, then setting them up for production for, you know, producing a crop that's, that's on us to be able to, to know what we need to do. But I love, I love that dynamic. Actually, I've had some, <laughs> some colonies where they feel feather light in the fall. And it's like, these things are just going to starve out. You know, I miss my window to feed them and you kind of just put them away for the winter and then you come back and they're still there in the spring and they're still feather light with the same amount of honey. <laughs> you know, they, it's like, they still have the same kind of pitiful stores of honey and there's, but they're still alive. So I, I, I would have thought they would start out, you know, starved out, but uh, I've been surprised time and time again by dynamics like that or, or scenarios and circumstances like that playing out too. It's always fun when you see something exciting like that. Yeah. You just, <laughs> yeah. you just smile and you go, okay, bees. Yeah. I guess you're doing you. I mean, well, yeah. what can I say at this point? Uh, and I caught something. Um, so here in Maine, we get a ton of pollen in early August and late July. Do you guys yep. have somewhat of a dearth? Yes. No, we do get a dearth uh, and it can be pretty intense. It's only, and it's funny. It, it doesn't really, it feels like some, some years it's just like a couple of weeks, but it's, a, it's a crucial couple of weeks, like two to three weeks. You know, I figure basswood for us is done by July 15th. So from July 15th to maybe like the first couple of weeks into August, it's pretty, it's, it can be pretty pitiful uh, for, for food. So, and especially in the population of bees that's subject to nutritional stress the most, and that's those nucleus colonies. Those are the young colonies that don't have, they don't have the, the ability to kind of, they don't have the stores like the production colonies do. So um, yeah, we, we do get some nutritional stress then. We do see some dearth. Um, but again, that's, that's changed too. Uh, obviously, you know, with, with, uh, with all the rain that we had last year, I think in July, I dare say we close to had like two feet of rain. Um, and in June we had like 18 inches of rain. I mean, you, you got, you remember you're not too far up the, up the ways there in Maine. But, um, so last year, you know, with all that water, there was just kind of constantly something available, but still we, I did still see some pressures of dearth, uh, in July, even with all the rain and a little bit of snack, the pollen coming in. Yeah. We, we get like, we're bone dry as far as nectar goes. Uh, probably by our, the tenth ish, our flow shuts off. We don't have many basswood around here, so our, the tail end of our flow is more like sumac typically. Um, mm -hmm. And we once the flow cuts off around the you know fifth, tenth, fifteenth of July, we get tons of pollen till the bees shut down in October, but or into late late September at least. But we like I just don't get a drop of nectar in that second half of July um, and then all of August. I mean, last year was kind of an exception and we got, the bees started to draw comb and the honey supers again, because I, I put on honey supers in the fall, like you hoping, hoping they can make a crop. And they started to draw them out again in late August around like the 23rd. But that was the earliest fall flow I've had and I've been beekeeping. This will be my seventh season, so six years. Yeah. And we had never gotten a flow, um, and a fall flow before September. And we, we never get any light nectar pretty much at all in that summer dearth period, but we get infinite pollen. Just the bees are just drowning in pollen. That's, wow. That's, yeah. oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, no, if they can, and if it's, if it's a good pollen source, then you, and there's correlation obviously with your colonies being really robust and healthy. What, what a wonderful thing to, you know, to have. Yep. Yeah, and I've I've done some feeding in August, some sugar syrup because they they've needed some in certain years. But it's uh we we have such a short season. I would guess that you have a dearth because your season's a little bit longer, or yeah, mm -hmm. a little bit longer than ours. You said you got your first pollen. We definitely don't have first pollen yet. Um, what what's it, what is your first pollen? I'm curious. 
Um, if I'm looking at the environment and just kind of looking at today, it looked like it was coming in from some like a like willows, um, aspen. Um, the aspens of the catkins are just starting to pop today. We've had like today it was like it got into the mid 50s. It's just been really weird weather. We've been having this that's kind of really warm, sunny days. I mean, the the maple, you know, the guys who are out sugaring are just running around like crazy because the, 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 there's like an artesian well under every maple tree right now, you know, just gushing sap. So, uh, yeah, no, spring has come early. Um, it's definitely started, I should say, early. Whether or not we get some more snow before the you know middle of April, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> it's it's starting. So that's called beekeeping in New England, right there. Yes. Yep. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I mean, last year I think where at least in Maine where I am, we were about a week early. But since it rained every day in June, I don't think we were really anywhere ahead by September. <laughs> yeah, it was. Just I, a I typically. Year. I typically see first pollen coming in like March 20th, March 18th, you know, kind of like the middle, yeah. middle. I mean, we're not too far off the middle of the month, but it's, it feels like it's about a week and a half, maybe two weeks ahead, you know, from, from where I'm usually yeah. used to seeing pollen. Yeah. Art, um, for me, I use patties in the spring uh, and I always put on patties when the crocuses bloom yep. and that's typically the last week of March or the first week of April. But it's weird because 2020 was like the latest spring. I've had in six years. Yeah. 2021 was the earliest spring I had. 2021 was probably three to four weeks earlier than 2020. So it was just like a really big swing. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you, how, what have you, had you had earlier springs than this in the past? Yeah. I know. I remember reading through my notes. There was a, uh, I think it was in 2000 and I don't know if it was, there's been one, I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, we had, I recall one season, it was a while ago, where where bees were hauling in pollen like pretty readily and, and, and like we had catkins that were fully opened um, and it was, it was spring and we didn't get any more snow and it was, I think, I think I, it was like the middle of March, like March 13th or something. And it was spring was full on then. And, and I remember, you know, thinking it, it was going to, and I remember, yeah, we didn't get any more snow. April came along and it was just like, wow, you were, if you were waiting on, if you were waiting on April to do your bee work, you were already falling behind because the bees had, you know, brood, you know, piling up in the colonies for the last couple of weeks now. So. Yeah. Well, that's, that's certainly exciting. Uh, I wanted to close on one more question. So how do you encourage your growth in the spring? Like, I don't. I don't think you use pollen patties from in the early spring, but I'm just curious. What are your, yeah, no, what are your methods? Yeah, I will use pollen substitute, um, especially in the colonies that we're raising queen cells in. Um, yeah, it, and uh, just to get them going, and so we have kind of consistent population. Um, so yeah, on a on the populations of bees are raising cells, we'll we'll feed them pollen patties, pollen substitute. Other than that, yeah, I don't really want to encourage to. I mean, if there's if there's a population out there that's struggling you know, we'll, we'll, we'll provide frames of honey or syrup or pollen, but for the most part, colonies that are healthy and, uh, and, and doing fine on their own, obviously we get that night, like, you know, spring for us, probably like you is, it's pretty abundant with, with, with pollen and nectar. So we really don't need to feed. Um, so I, I kind of let nature do a lot of the heavy lifting with, with that and let that, let nature kind of stimulate them. Cause if I get, if I push every single colony, you know, artificially in a sense, or stimulate them with pollen substitute, I'm just going to get behind and work. Like, it's nice to have, it's nice to kind of stagger um, the the growth of some of the, some of the colonies, in particular, the nucleus colonies. I don't, if, if they can kind of, if they, if I can get like, um, if I can get like a, a week where the nukes don't need my attention, like in May, for example, because I try to get around all the production colonies first to evaluate breeders, to, you know, get them ready to produce the crop of honey. So while I'm doing that, if the nucleus colonies are still kind of in this buildup mode and they have space to grow into, it's nice because then when I'm done getting back, you know, doing all my honey production stuff, I can get to the nukes and they're kind of primed for me to now take it, you know, take advantage of what's going on there. So it's almost like, um, you know, if you're doing some sort of uh, like uh, what's the like uh, secession planting or, you know, where you got a crop of specific kind of whether you whatever crop, you know, you're planting different secessions to, you know, get something uh, out into the season. I kind of look at it with bees if I can have a population, if the nukes can kind of be stimulated by nature, which would be a little bit behind, um, you know, the, the schedule that most beekeepers would want, you know, when it comes to stimulating them with pollen substitute, it just works in my favor that, favor that way. If that, does that make sense? 
Yeah. Do you, do you um, equalize at all? Or is that part of your spring yep. management? Yeah, we'll yep. equalize. Oh, yeah. No, we need to, to you know, try, to trying to make sure that everything is being used wisely. Uh, just try to keep swarming down. The, the trick is obviously for swarming is to stay ahead of it before the bees even get to that, in, you know, that propensity or that impulse to swarm. So, you know, in, in late April, while the colonies are still not thinking about it or they're just starting to think about it, that's when we really get busy at equalizing. By then, the temperatures are somewhat stable. Or you can take whole frames of brood and move them onto some weaker colonies without the brood being compromised in the weaker colonies. And that's the biggest thing for equalizing for me is like in the spring, it's so very the temperatures fluctuate so much that it, it's hard to it's hard to know how much, you know, you 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 can you know some years you want you want like five to five four five six frames of brood in every box and. Some some colonies really just can't muster that, you know, they're just not there yet. Or so I I am always kind of I feel sometimes in some in some in some locations where it's like that the, the the if the weather was a little bit more stable, it'd make equalizing a little bit more easier for me. But yeah. anyways, we do, we just push through and get it done. How do you uh, do you have any tips on how to do it fast? Because you obviously do it on a lot of colonies and you don't have much help. So how do you how do you do it quickly and effectively? Um, we just kind of, again, going into the yard, uh, if we're in production yards, you know, colonies, my production colonies are in, in two deep supers, they overwinter in two deeps. So we just crack the supers, uh, you know, get into the brood nest and, and look at, you know, look at the population. And obviously most of the brood at this point in time, if it's not completely encased in honey stills in the top box. So we can kind of look at the, look at the cluster. And then um, once we kind of get all the, essentially what you get, just going to take the covers off all the, you know, most of the col colonies in the yard, if they're not robbing or whatever, you can kind of get an idea for what the average population is and just kind of go through and, and the, the, obviously the strong ones, they're easy to determine. The weak ones are easy to determine. And I like to equalize the medium strength ones before the weaker ones, especially earlier in the season, because the medium strength colonies take care of the brood better than the really weak ones. And the really weak ones, obviously, they might be really weak for a reason. They might be sick or they might have no queen. So I always kind of go like a trickle down effect with equalizing, you know, start from really take the resources from the really strong, move them into the medium strength ones, get them really strong, come back in a week or so. And uh, obviously before you come back, but assess why the weak ones are weak. And when you can come back and the weak ones are still there and they're still kicking, you can, if I have the resources, then I'll really equalize those to get them to full strength or we just drop nukes in them, you know, like uh, that's, that's one thing that's really nice with the nucleus colonies. Instead of, instead of dealing with moving brood around into them and they got a dead queen, we just bring in nukes and requeen them right there with the nuke. And it's got the brood right in hand. Uh, if yeah. that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I have the luxury to go through each one so I can determine early on whether or not they're viable. And so that allows me to boost the weak ones early, even if it's more of a risk because I can spend more time shaking bees and, you know, fussing yep. with it. But that makes a lot of sense from an efficiency standpoint. So I appreciate it. I think I think there oh, will be people who can definitely use that. <laughs> well, try, there's all I'm always there's always a million ways to I, I feel like with beekeeping and any farming endeavor of agriculture, once the ship sets sail, like as a farm, once you kind of get established and you kind of get like a very proven way to produce something. It, for a farmer, it's hard to kind of, for some people, and for most, I, I, I like to think of majority, it's hard to adapt new things because, you know, there's just only so much time that, that you can kind of think about change. So for me, I'm always thinking, you know, in the winter and in the seasons where I'm not in the middle of it, that's when I try to write down, like, how can I, I need, I need to make a serious effort to do it differently because it looks like that way of doing it might be a little bit more efficient or it, it is efficient, but how do I, how do I integrate that into the, into my system, into the management scheme? So Absolutely. yeah, no, I'm right there with you, Rainier. We're always looking for ways to become more efficient, more better, more, more, uh, yeah, and that's not good grammar, but, uh, you know, better, <laughs> better beekeepers. <laughs> yeah. More better. Well, I really, I really, um, had a great time talking to you, Troy. Um, where can people find you? Um, where could they find me? They, um, they can find my email address is Troy at nhbkeeper.com. I have the YouTube channel. Um, I do my best to try to get back with people, but I have been, I've been finding, I I've been kind of getting bad with it. I've been getting, you know, emails just for queen order, you know, my usual business with orders for Queens and stuff right now comes through. So that's priority for me. So if people just have general questions and everything, yeah, submit them to my email or uh, you can call me. I got my phone number. 
on the well, actually you know don't call me <laughs> i don't have time to talk too much but uh yeah email be good and i'll do my best to get back with you in a timely manner all right and you have a facebook too right facebook as well yep all right well uh Thank you for coming on, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching. I certainly enjoyed talking to Troy tonight. We're going to head off and talk for a moment after this, but I hope you all have a great night or a um, great day if you're watching the replay. And uh, thanks for watching.